and that's why I want to talk about it today. Um, ride sharing is uh, actually around since the 60s, but uh, what you think ride sharing is and what we think at Summerway ride sharing has to be is completely different thing. So we will talk about that a little bit. And then uh, we will talk about uh, the importance of uh, sharing for the future mobility solutions and how ride sharing is a utilitarian solution and uh, some of its current position and offering and some of its vision and strategy. I mean, I feel so inadequate. But uh, that's not what we are focusing on because that form of ride sharing was around since the 60s. But it didn't really bring anything else than some joy for some people. Request a Moya simply by selecting a destination on the Moya app. You're ready in a few clicks. Our algorithm calculates a Moya to pick you up and a route that gets you to your chosen destination as quickly as possible. The app will direct you to the most convenient virtual stop, never more than 250 meters from you. It's important for all passengers that the vehicle keeps moving swiftly, so we use quick flow boarding, giving you a fair window of time to embark the vehicle without causing a delay to your or anyone else's journey. Sit back and enjoy the ride. We thought about how to make your journey as comfortable as possible. You'll notice that your seat has lots of space around it. While you will share your ride in a Moya, you won't have to share your personal space. The on-screen display notifies you that you have arrived. Step out at your virtual stop, meters from your destination. Moya, social movement. So that's what Moya says about themselves and uh, that is actually pretty much similar to what we are planning to do about ride sharing. So we are very happy to see that Moya, which is backed by Volkswagen, is already working on this. Um, I will come to a very interesting part about that though. Even though they are seeming to be a very high tech, very social uh, revolution company, they are still lacking some things. This was the, um, the, on the left you see like they are announcing their uh, one million rides and then there is Dr. Agvil is telling like your customer service sucks. So I just uh, took the opportunity to contact that person and ask like uh, what was the reason for his comments like that because I sort of knew exactly why it would be. And then he explained the, she explained the reason. Um, that uh, actually there isn't any route matching. Uh, it's basically an Uber which is trying to pick up several passengers without having, uh, even having a smart route merging system. So what happens is that you are sitting at an Uber and then someone else is calling your Uber and then you are in it and going and driving and picking that person and someone else is calling for an Uber. You may again have a detour. So this was crazy. I knew that they weren't uh, really pretty good about it yet, but I didn't know that they didn't have the technology to merge it yet because that's what we are working here. We are trying to have uh, several passengers at the same time without having any detour for any one of them and Volkswagen is not even managing that. So that's why it is important to focus on the sharing uh, ability of the mobility space. So what we do, um, Samave is uh, around since uh, late uh, 2016. Some of you know the founder Rasmus already. And uh, we have been um, finishing the not so rocket science part of the app, uh, which is just setting your trip and then um, setting your role, carpool as a driver or a passenger, and then um, how many times you're gonna do this trip, date and time, and how flexible you are if you're gonna find a match. And then if, uh, if there is a matching uh, driver or passenger uh, on the other side, you are just matching and going. 
it's not that rocket science. This is the part. The rocket science part is coming when you need to merge more people into the same car and, uh, and actually how you can convince those drivers to be so committed and loyal to that route that they should take every day. That is the difficult part and that is the service part of our system. So why ride sharing? Of course we know that in, in Oslo you can actually um, save time if you have a passenger on the side as an electric car owner and uh, that's why most of our users are EV owners. And the uh, cost sharing aspect is important of course. Um, for some commuters uh, if they are not really living um, relatively close to public transportation points, uh, they have less walk. And uh, for suburban commuters, commuters especially, instead of actually switching mode of transport, they may maybe have the whole uh, journey completed with the ride sharing. And uh, what we are trying to do is convincing the fossil fuel car owners to switch to EV uh, ride sharing so that they just leave their cars if they don't need it during the day and they can just ride share with the EV owners. And of course, uh, <laughs> social connection as much as you decide. Not maybe like Madonna level, but uh, you can talk or you can just agree that you don't need to talk during the way. So um, what is the advantage of ride sharing for the society? Well, first of all, there are no professional drivers. There are no additional cars added into the traffic. What Moya does is adding like 100 new uh, vehicles into Hamburg streets. And uh, just for the testing, they are currently testing. What happens uh, when they are actually really convincing the city, we don't know yet. And uh, there are no uh, need for infrastructure investment. It's the car that you are driving every day. It's the road that you are driving on every day. So you don't need to do any more public investment. And uh, current technology is already allowing for peer-to-peer -peer matching. So it's just plug in and go. And uh, we are working on smart multiple passenger routes matching and merging. So it's very soon. And you can already have real-time tracking, whether your driver is on the way or not. So um, because it is already at this uh, state, we had a campaign with Brockar in the summer. And um, it was very nice to see that the numbers were already reaching the on-demand uh, bus service level. So we were not known to people in that region, but they were picking up. So coming to public transportation, just think about 10 years ago. How was the public transportation experience to today? Uh, because we didn't have any Uber. Like if you were needing to go somewhere at some off time of the day, and if you were in a hurry, you can actually take Uber. Not here, but in many other places. We had iPhone 3GS, which means like we were basically doing nothing actually with our phones. Um, no router app or like no Google Maps, which is giving commute information like today and no WhatsApp app so that you cannot really communicate with people, send your location, send your live location, uh, I'm on my way or this or that, there wasn't anything like that. And if you are sitting in traffic, no Netflix or no Instagram to make yourself busy with. So this was how we were. We were pretty lost when you think. But if we were going back to that time and ask to ourselves, probably we didn't have any problem about it. We were okay with it. Today, we have so many options. Uh, you know all about these ones. I will not go into detail. So you can even test the autonomous shuttles in Oslo. They are on a break right now, but I think they're going to start on mid-October again. So we have so many options. Like um, we can just choose whatever. They are all working just by our phone, and uh, we don't need to worry much. But uh, we know that probably we will not be having enough of this because already now when the bus is a little bit late we are having a problem when the when we are just thinking like okay this was supposed to be here now we are having a problem like uh, we are now getting a little bit of an itchy about having schedules and actually pushing ourselves to fit that schedule so there is already something needed and when you ask to the consultants in uh, really big uh, companies like McKinsey and Deloitte and others, uh, their mobility divisions are foreseeing that uh, 
commuting in 2030 is not going to be so far from what you see here. Um, there is not going to be any daily commuting. And uh, we will have more home office work. And uh, we will not have colleagues and come maybe to Novit office, but we will more like uh, work in at some co workspace close to our house with some other people than our company colleagues, uh, which has already started, by the way. Uh, and then um, we are coming to on-demand public transportation, like Moya is trying to uh, show in the Hamburg. And we will have autonomous public transportation. And we will have urban air mobility, which is expected to be in London skies, not so later than seven years. Um, the all of these uh, new developments are having one common point, and that is that they are shared. So how is it looking uh, in the near future for the uh, transportation uh, in our lives? Uh, we all know that first technologies merge. Uh, we got mobile payments. We had location services enabled. We had all these things which we didn't have put together in one form before. And all those things enabled us doing and using so many other things in our lives, new services. So innovations are leading the uh, way, and then we adopt, and then operators are adapting afterwards because they see like this is how it works. And uh, the near future public transportation is going to be also like that. It's going to be autonomous and it's going to be shared. It's going to be more on demand. We will have less scheduled buses, more on demand, smaller buses. And uh, so that we will actually uh, have more efficient. Uh, mode of transport. It's going to be smaller vehicles, as you saw, like six people, eight people, shorter routes, because uh, I'm going to demand, you're going to demand, and he's going to demand. And if we are demanding the similar route, we will be put into the same vehicle anyway. So that means like we will not have 30 stops on the way and lose one minute in every stop and uh, actually go the 20 minutes right in 40 minutes. It's not going to happen anymore. And we will have similar start and end points. And we will probably have quite homogeneous group with us also, because they're going to start from where we are living. And they're going to go where we are actually going. So most likely, our profiles are going to be uh, quite similar as well. And it's going to be an enabling more door-to-door -door, uh, experience. This is uh, <laughs> the reason it is so tweaked, is that it's from a photo I took yesterday. Uh, I was in Bergen uh, to listen about Bergen Kommune's uh, mobility purchasing uh, plans. And um, there was a, uh, and the researcher from Bergen Kommune which showed this uh, slide. I liked it. <laughs> and I'm sure you're going to like it also. Uh, he was saying, like, it looks very engineered. Yes, it is looking like an engineer was preparing it. But uh, it is very, very clear where we are going. And I was very happy to see that he was adding uh, ride sharing in exactly in the way that I would add. So um, as you can see, <laughs> it is uh, ride sharing is a very good combo of uh, using all the resources that we have, because it is, as he was pointing out, it is private co uh, collective. So this is the key here. We have a lot of private resource, and we can actually use it collectively. And that will enable us to save money from all other uh, public investments that we are still made for us. Um, coming to public investment, uh, we all know about this uh, ambitious uh, target we have in Oslo. And, um, the cost of converting to emission-free fleet is uh, 1.1 uh, million kroner, like uh, actually it's billion then. Uh, it is uh, for, because we have 1,150 buses, 200 minibuses uh, operated by Ruter. And uh, if they are really wanting to change everything to emission-free uh, fleet, they need to invest that much money and they're working on it. And, uh, in the meantime, <laughs> we are having 260,000 private cars in Oslo. 
And if you also add Akersus region, we have 60,000 electric vehicles registered in this area. Can you see the enormous fleet that we are collectively owning, actually? And when you add the advantages of electric vehicles, that they actually don't pay tax, they are having this and that, that's, that's also public money, right? Because whatever benefit we are giving to them actually is also coming from the public pocket. So we are paying for the 60,000 electric vehicles together in some way, and we are also paying together so that Ruter can actually finally bring us to uh, our emission targets. It is a pressure for no good reason. We can just uh, help a little bit to Ruter and actually get things done a little bit faster. Because if you, if you take the 60,000 registered electric vehicles in Oslo, and if only 5% of those drivers were convinced to share their rides on some way, we are getting 135 additional buses with 6,000 passengers in them. So um, why not start now? Because right now, um, Samaway is already able to have a peer-to-peer -peer mobility marketplace. And uh, our user growth is currently based on uh, pilots. And uh, th we are just trying to get individual users by those pilots. Uh, and currently, we are having this uh, edge, edge distribution for the uh, mobility space. Um, with our app and the API, this, uh, this thing, the first version of our API, it is very easy to open the, this fleet space that we are able to manage to everyone's use. And then uh, we can actually have public transportation operator users uh, just uh, seeing the rides available at some way and join these rides. So this is the easy part. This is the shorter uh, vision. Uh, and the next stage we are thinking about, we can give this capacity utilization feature to many fleet operators uh, because we have um, like Rubil uh, and, uh, and then we have uh, other uh, companies who are now working on um, some models so that uh, their cars can be mm, used as subscription based. Uh, all these uh, car retailers are working on that. And we also have still taxi fleets, which is also possible to share. So uh, our second uh, stage is going to be more about giving this sharing capacity to all other actors in this area. And when we have all these uh, players already using the data and the uh, abilities we provide, then we will be sitting on a very, very uh, uh, valuable information, which we can use for smart and fair toll pricing and uh, proactive and real-time rerouting by type of the vehicle and uh, the occupancy information so that we can prevent congestion and pollution. So what type of market are we talking about? We are talking about the very big market, which is like 35 billion kroner. And uh, so this is the market opportunity we are facing. Uh, if we are starting to serve for on-demand uh, public transportation operations, fleet sharing and scheduled bus service, uh, then we have uh, our ecosystem completed, which can be complementary to each other. So our revenue model is based on this uh, growth strategy, currently based on transaction and peer-to-peer uh, -peer usage. And uh, this can easily be transformed to patronage dividend-based pilot agreements with corporates, which we did before. And uh, negative incentive agreement with cities. Uh, negative incentive in the sense that uh, if someone is actually leaving their car at home and sharing the ride with someone, then they're going to be rewarded. Uh, this, uh, this method is very much used in Netherlands. Why not use here? And uh, public transportation operators can have this uh, ride sharing license, uh, license and uh, service rollout uh, from us. And uh, they just need to plug it into their system, and then all the rest of the operation is our job because they already have the fleet operation, but uh, private, uh, private public fleet operation is our business, so that we can do for them. And uh, then revenue sharing model for the car share and fleet operators for subscription and usage ratio. Um, we are working on this uh, already um, 
bit uh, Mobinex project. Mobinex project is the Innovation Norway project, which we got our funding for, and um, uh, we are working with uh, Entur and Rutar, Columbus, Prakarshus, uh, and many others, which I actually didn't add here. Um, so our purpose is to integrating ride sharing into a public transportation system and uh, by that way enabling some seamless connection between different modes of transport uh, so that people can either choose uh, the whole way as ride sharing or complementary to other modes of transportation. Um, our aim is to teach people and the communities that they don't need uh, full fledged service all the time 24 seven. They can actually have some self-sufficient uh, system for their mobility. And uh, hopefully by the end of this project, actually being able to give a single ticket experience to these uh, users that they can actually book their rides uh, via any operator and uh, use their um, subscription uh, cards or anything and uh, use whatever app that they are always using, not some away app, but whatever operator they are using, just share their rides with those apps. That is the ultimate goal of the project. This project from Innovation Norway brought us a very uh, um, like valuable partner mix actually. Norway, we are working for the past uh, five months and uh, they are helping us by transforming our real startup uh, coding environment into a scalable startup environment. So we are very happy to work with them. And uh, Enter is the part of Mobinex uh, project and they're going to be our uh, API test partner. If they uh, validate our API that it can be shared by others, uh, then we will have a big go. <laughs> and uh, our other pilot partners are already working with us in a couple of uh, uh, projects that we already completed and planning. And uh, they are the core of uh, user information, user insight and user uh, experience. So if this is all very good, if we have all these names on board, what are the problems we are sharing? Rideshare has some barriers, uh, not only in Norway, but uh, in other places as well. Since I worked for ridesharing company for the past six years in Turkey, I know very well. Uh, in Turkey, we have, in Istanbul, we have six million commuters daily. There, there's a reason I didn't put that uh, slide here because marching Turks in Europe is not a good scene, but <laughs> imagine six million Norwegians, like just going on buses and trains uh, every morning and every evening. It's, it's not a good sight, I can tell you. I, I've lived there, I know that. But that gives us uh, a lot of knowledge about how um, commuting patterns are and how it can become. The advantage in Norway is that you have legislations and environment which is uh, supporting it and you also have personal awareness about environment, climate, and uh, also a little bit of responsibility feeling. Uh, in Islam, it's more like a jungle. I have to survive. But here we are thinking about each other. So that is good for ride sharing. But still, there are some barriers. Uh, enemy one is skepticism. I'm hearing this one uh, a lot. Uh, nobody wants to get into a stranger's car. If it was a shared city car, maybe, uh, then it is possible. Uh, but then I'm telling like 10,000 10, people thought it was okay. We got downloaded by more than 10,000 people already and most of them are drivers. And if a driver is already on some way and you happen to be the passenger on some way, be sure that person has no problem about getting you into his car because if he didn't want, he wouldn't be on some way. So that is very clear. It's like Tinder. Like on Tinder, everybody's there for dating, right? You don't, you don't feel like, oh, should I just send a message to that person? No, just send it. That person is there because of that reason. So instead of uh, skepticism, we should think like there's free will. Nobody's pushing anyone. The other enemy is generalizing. The ride-sharing pilots never work in this country. Every time they, it was tried, the numbers were never like very high. Uh, well, every use case, every pilot partner, every region, and every version of the app which is tested is different. Just remember Einstein, what was he saying? Like doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is uh, madness. This is like that. It is 
we are testing different things because we are not mad. So everything is going to be different. Every pilot is going to be different. And the uh, other enemy is, I heard about it, I downloaded it, but there was no one. Yes, because you're not in the pilot region. And we are not uh, crazy enough to actually spend our all marketing money into everywhere so that everybody can download and find someone. The cost of it is amazing. We saw uh, how Uber is growing. Uh, they are growing, yes, everybody knows about them. And every time you click on a mm, like button, you get something. But do you also know that it is uh, done with the cost of $5 billion loss every year? Yeah, we can do that. If we can convince some crazy investors, we could do the same. So reality is that priorities. We have our priorities, and that those are our pilots. And about pilots, how is the pilot uh, happening, actually? It is happening in six weeks. We don't need months or years of preparation. In week one, with whomever we are testing, we are just deciding on the use case. There are a couple of use cases sometimes, not only one. Um, it could be, like in Brockar's case in the summer, it was um, like they weren't having the school bus anymore in the summer and they just needed something to replace with. In some other cases, it could be that you're operating a like, loss-generating line and you need to actually replace it with some self-sufficient system. Like Whatever is the case, in the first week, we are working on that. In the second week, after deciding which use case we are going, the pilot partner and us are sitting and thinking about the campaign message, preparing the communication plan, briefing their agency, and the agencies are usually picking up these things very well. And uh, on week four, we are deciding on our KPIs together and uh, how we're going to measure these things and how often are we going to report these things and what are our targets. And on week six, like, pilot starts. It's that easy. So we just say, like, just do it. Because uh, if you just think and wonder, it's never going to be done. And in the meantime, a lot of things are changing. People are changing their habits. The phones are changing. Something else is being added. And what you talk about is not becoming that compatible anymore. So in two and a half years, we did five pilots. We had more than 1,000 pilot participants. And on top of it, we had more than 10,000 individual users. So we know what we are doing. And in our completed pilots, uh, we did with Telenor, we did in Fornebu, uh, we did with uh, NSV, which is, uh, at that time it was NSV, but now it's VU. Um, and we got uh, more and more participants joining, and these uh, pilots are not made like uh, with pre-selected group of people. We are just going, and whomever we are targeting, we are just targeting with the regular marketing, because we should also test the idea, right? And how this message is being taken, because then we can tweak it next time. And uh, people who believe in it are downloading it, they are just joining it by their free will, and of course we are having some incentives from time to time, depending on our KPIs. And then if they like it, they keep using it. If they don't like it, they don't use it. And uh, that was the case with, uh, like NSV case, for example. The message was told to us that uh, there should be free parking space to people who are coming with ride sharing. And uh, because parking is a problem. Yeah, that was all prepared like that and everything started like that. But what we saw is that in the three stations of this pilot, there were actually no parking problems. Uh, parking space was so empty, people didn't need to do that. So yes, they were downloading it, but then they were actually not needing it. So that wasn't a very well-performing one, but all the others were actually performing quite well. And in Brockar case, for example, the shared rights compared to uh, number of participants is a little bit low, but then um, I also understand why it is like that, because those three cities were not even intersecting with each other. One person from one city and the other person the, uh, from other city couldn't even match because there isn't such a road. So we should just think about all these factors when we are judging the pilot.